Welcome to Cheltenham Town Hall and the Cheltenham Science Festival. Uh, but before we start, I'm going to hand the mic over to Atty, who's going to give this event a little bit of context. Yes, thank you, Mikey. So I'm Atty Emmett. I'm the Director of Strategy and Business Relationships at the uh, very long name, the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council, the EPSRC. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you here, first of all, to the Times at Cheltenham Science Festival, but also specifically to this uh, RISE debate on why do we need inspiring leaders. Now, EPSRC is sponsoring this event today, and I'll just explain um, why. EPSRC funds long-term research and postgraduate training, PhDs, for, to a first approximation. And we have £800 million of government money, public money, your money, each year to invest in that way. Now, why do we do that? Firstly, we're aiming to ensure that the UK maintains its international standing as a research nation. And in that respect... We might not be the biggest in the world, but we punch well above our weight. We are well up there with the best. So maybe not the biggest, but we're up there with the best. But it's not just about that. It is about ensuring that that research has impact. And that impact might be to do with improving quality of life. It might be about improving the economy. It might be about the environment or, or other things. The impact comes in a whole series of different ways. Now, one of the ways that we do that is by supporting leaders, developing leaders. In our case, that's research leaders, and of course leaders is broader than that, but we, we fund research leaders. And in the UK, it's a, a real pleasure to be able to say that we have an awful lot of very, very talented, highly talented individuals in, in, in our research community. And uh, within the panel today, and because I'm on it, I'll, I'll say it's a great panel, um, uh, we have some of those, uh, uh, those researchers and research leaders with us. They are part of what we call our RISE campaign, where RISE being recognising, inspiring scientists and engineers. So the panel today will be exploring that question, and, and we can go broad, we can go less. It doesn't have to be about research leaders. We were discussing that earlier. I'll, I'll give it over to uh, Mikey now, and I think you'll find that many of us are as intrigued about how this talkie will work as you perhaps are in the audience. Mikey, to you. Thanks, Hattie. Um, so, yeah, so this, uh, before we get into the main debate, I just want to introduce Tokioki. So you may not have seen this glowing round table before. It's pretty simple. It's just a table of chat. Um, there's something about the roundness of it and the glowingness that gets people talking, and it's that simple. And it's just about talking to the microphone. Although, one of the things about Tokioki is we want to make the most of all the brains in the room. Uh, that includes all of you around the table, not just sitting at the table. So we've got Abby. Where's Abby? Um, at the back there with a roving microphone. So if you want to say something, just attract her attention and my attention, because uh, we want you to get involved in this discussion as well. Um, you've probably got just, just as, uh, as useful and, and meaningful things to say as um, the people around the table. Uh, we're all experts here of our, of our own fields. Uh, and I just need to say one other thing, actually, because some of you in the uh, audience will have noted that uh, on the billing today, uh, David Willits had appeared. Well, David's been called away to a European um, negotiation. Uh, but I did want uh, to, to say that, you know, David, in his brief as science minister, has been a great supporter of the Science Festival here in Cheltenham. And he's been to every single one. This is the first one that he's missed. And I know that he really regrets having been called away today. So um, that's one of the reasons why I'm sat around the table now. So I hope I could do something to make up for that absence. I'm sure you can. Um, so what we're going to do now is just introduce the people around the table and see where this takes us. So I'm going to start over here. Tell us your name and why do you think you've been invited here? Why do we need inspiring people? <laughs> uh, my name is Imran Khan and I'm Chief Executive of the British Science Association. And I think I'm invited here to talk about why science need a bigger, needs a bigger leadership role out there in society. Okay, so it's not just about leadership... Science leadership mm. in science. It's actually about science leaders in society. Exactly. Well. Science doesn't exist in a vacuum. If anything, it needs to be less vacuum-like, if you know what I mean. It needs to be part of society, part of culture, interacting with everything else that's going on in our, in our world. Okay. We'll, we'll move on. Hello. Hi. I'm Liz Ogilvie. I work for an organisation called No Innovation, with a K, I hasten to add. Um, <laughs> and um, we work with a lot of the RISE leaders um, and a lot of the academics in British universities and a lot with the EPSRC, uh, leading things called sand pits and other academic workshops to enable scientists to come up with some great ideas. And I guess that's why I'm here. 
Do you know the answer to the question? Why do we need to um, I find it really interesting because we see a lot of um, leaders in action. Some are more or less inspiring than others. And I think there's some real... Um, I think there's some real lessons that we can learn. Okay, we'll come to some of these things as we go around. Hello, I'm uh, Andrew Sherry, one of the British academics. Uh, I work at the University of Manchester where I direct the Dalton Nuclear Institute. Okay, um, and have you got an opening <laughs> thing that you'd like to say? Well, I think we need inspiring leaders because we need uh, new ideas, we need new people to come into science, and we need new ways of doing things out there in the wider world. Nick Bayliss, uh, I'm a psychologist and I'm interested in how lives go well. In answer to the question, uh, do we need inspiring leaders, I'd say yes because we don't have any. Um, I came here today because I thought an MP might be here so I could have a go at there being no inspiring MPs for a long time now. Uh, and It's telling that he's not here. He obviously read my mind on that one. So okay. I, I look forward to... Um, and I. I also think that we shouldn't be asking, uh, I, I, I think it's the wrong question to ask. What's the right question? Uh, how do we create inspiring leaders rather than um, do we need any because uh, I don't think we know how to create them. Okay. Um, yeah, um, we'll maybe explore that in a bit. Sorry. Hi, I'm Rodrigo Kian I'm a professor at the University of Leicester and I had the honor to be selected as one of these inspiring leaders. And basically, I mean, the quick answer to the question for me is why, I mean, do we need inspiring leaders for me is yes, not, not because of me, but because I had inspiring leaders during my career and without them, I wouldn't be here. Okay, so they've brought you to where you are now. Exactly. And yeah. to keep that going, we need to keep creating inspiring leaders. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm Claire Craig. I work for the government's chief scientific advisor. And I'm really, I'm here because I'm particularly interested in uh, leadership in bringing advice to government, um, cutting across all sorts of disciplines. So what is it that, what leaders do within the science community that provides the advice that government wants on timescales that might be hours when there's an emergency, like Fukushima, right. to um, years to tackle the really kind of wicked problems like obesity or the future of cities. Okay, so there's actually different kinds of of, you know, of, of speeds of advice. It could be something that we, you know, you just need to pick up the phone. You need someone on the end of the phone. Um, okay, moving on. So I'm Wendy Hall. Um, I'm here because I'm, because uh, I'm one of the inspiring leaders. I think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not one of the younger ones. I'm one of the <laughs> older ones. I'm not quite sure where that puts me on the list. But um, uh, so I'm. I'm. Uh, uh, I have, uh, I'm, I'm a dean at the moment at the University of Southampton and I manage the Web Science Institute there. And I'm just looking up on my website for years. I've had the quote from Proverbs, where there is no vision, the people perish. Right. And that's what I've lived my life by. I think that um, leaders need to have a vision right. and lead and inspire people to help achieve that vision. Not everyone is... Uh, capable of being a leader, and there are all sorts of different leaders, okay. but inspiration is a huge part of it. Okay. Well, we've heard from Matty already, so I'm just going to move around over here. Hiya, I'm Marianne Ellis. I'm um, a lecturer, a senior lecturer at the University of Bath. I'm a um, biochemical engineer. Um, I'm here as one of 10 EPSRC rising stars, so a potential leader of the future. Yeah. Um, and my answer to the question is yes, absolutely we need inspiring leaders, because for me, ultimately, um, they are the people that make you want to go to work in the morning um, okay. and be there, and they're the people that actually really inspire you to go forward with achievement. Who makes you want to go to work in the morning? Um, <laughs> um, all sorts of people, actually, yeah. and not just at my university, but yeah. um, actually I have, to, I have to mention my, um, my previous head of department and my PhD supervisor, Professor Julian Chowdhury, right. who is now um, dean up at, at Bradford, but he's the one that inspired me to go right. into regenerative medicine, um, and he has, his leadership has just been amazing to me. His positiveness and his optimism has really inspired me. Okay. So now we're at the point where we, this is where Tokioki really kicks into gear because we can talk about any and all of these things. And if anyone's got suggestions from the audience, or someone over there, uh, maybe actually you could probably pass that to okay. How long does it stretch? What were you going to say? Yes, uh, definitely inspiring leaders, but that's only half of, or part of it. Uh, we 
uh, inspiring leaders can lead us to disaster if they pick the wrong path to go. So we need a bit of both. Can you give us an example of where a leader uh, Well, it's opinions, but... Uh, uh, well, ex-Prime Minister called Tony Blair was very inspiring to many and uh, everybody wouldn't agree he led us in the right direction, certainly not militarily. You felt that he was inspiring, uh, but yeah, inspiring Charisma. doesn't necessarily mean the right direction. Let's have that mic back. Um, okay, so um, there's a few, there's a few uh, questions on the table there. Where do we want to go with this? Do we want to talk about... Yep. I think that captures one of the things we think about leaders doing, which is risk-taking. That kind of shows the path yeah. that it's possible to take. They kind of they make the innovations, and sometimes that risk-taking is really important. And so to pick two scientific examples, you've got Barry Marshall. So he's the guy that discovered that this bacteria Helicobacter pylori caused right. stomach cancer, stomach right. ulcers, okay. and he did that by swallowing a vial of this bacteria because no one would believe him. So he did an experiment on himself. Wow. So real risk-taking there, on one hand. On the other hand, you've still got the example of Andrew Wakefield, MMR, where he took the risk of publishing this unverified and un okay. unsuitable data. So I think that really captures the same point as perhaps the Tony Blair one. You can, you can go too far with risks, but risk-taking is important to leadership. Okay. Do, we, do we need our leaders to be risk-takers? Um, Andrew? Well, working in the nuclear industry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or with the nuclear industry, uh, we certainly need inspiring leaders, and I'll, I'll give you one, one for me, and, and the risk thing comes up yeah. here. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mike uh, Wait, Waitman uh, from the Office of Nuclear Regulation is one of the most inspiring people I've known who, who's, who's got an independent view on risk of energy generation, specifically nuclear, and understanding what that risk is and the balance of risk versus benefit and so on is absolutely critical, yeah. and having a clear view on how to make that balance in a way that's open and transparent is, is, is important. Kind of linking that to this idea that Imran brought in that scientists are, make good leaders full stop. Do you think scientists understand risk maybe more than the, ge the general lay person? Well, if you ask a statistician, I suspect they'd have a particular definition of risk which would be more complete than my own. Um, risk is, an, uh, is a fascinating... Taking risks, maybe. Um... Yes, some will, some won't. You know, there's, there's, there's probably a you know a spread of, uh, of of scientists who will take risks and, and others that, that won't. You know, I think we all take risk every day. You know, driving down the motorway from Manchester today was probably the most dangerous thing I've done all week. Right. Um, so yeah, we weigh up the pros and the cons and, and the benefits and the risks and so on and, and you know in everyday life. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to link that to something that I remember hearing, which is good leaders are made by good followers. Um, and uh, we all are. We all are at different times. We're all leaders in some areas, and we're followers in others. I would say. Um, but when it, uh, we've got about fifteen thousand uh, scientists and engineers working in government government agencies, I asked a few of them what they wanted. One of the things that comes out time and time again is good leaders listen to the people around them. That's actually part of what makes them able to take good risks, sensible risks. Right. But they draw out the people in their teams. They make them give of their best. And that's a really important part of leadership. Um, if I could take the discussion back to the idea of every individual needs to develop um, the ability to act courageously. Right. And we don't teach this in schools. Uh, right. we, we prioritize teaching science, but I, I think at the core of being a, uh, good in science or good in the arts, crafts or whatever, is having personal courage. And we spend billions on curing cancer, or at least pretending to, uh, but we don't in explore cowardice um, right. and I think we do that uh, at school uh, I, I work a, a great deal with schools and they they're just they're uh, they're not interested in teaching right. what I suspect they'd, they'd uh, you, refer to as soft skills how would you start to teach courage uh, the study of lifetimes and those people who have behaved courageously right. um, uh, whether in in science arts war and everything in between there are um but i, I I'm, I'm just amazed yeah. that it, it's not a, addressed in schools yeah. uh, uh or indeed anywhere else i mean do you think our schools are could do i mean this is one suggestion but do you think that's where the lead this idea of leadership should be uh i guess um kind of uh fostered and and, and grown it's it's the schools that that are the sort of main uh development place for I really don't know. I'm not sure. Perhaps, perhaps in the family home, at university level, I, I, I really haven't got an opinion. Yeah, yeah. can I just build on that? Um, 
when we work um, with academics, um, when we start an event, there's two things we ask them to do. One is to have courage, and it's the courage to think differently. Yeah. Um, it's very easy to think the same and to, to be the same, but it's sometimes very diff diff difficult to step out. Right. And I think that's what differentiates an inspiring leader. It's somebody who's got the courage to step out of the norm. The second thing we ask people to do, and as yeah. adults, I think it's really interesting, is we ask people to be curious. Right. And I think as we grow up, we actually become less curious. Okay. Um, and I think that's also a really interesting skill for leadership, actually, is, is curiosity and courage and this ability to engage. Do you think these things can be taught? How do we get people to I, I don't. I don't think necessarily they can be taught. I think it's about exposing people and enabling people and I think providing people with an environment that they're comfortable in doing both those things. I think they're inherent in all of us. Okay. Um, I'll come to you in a second because there's a couple of people around the table. Hang on to the mic in the meantime. Yeah, I think the point I'd like to, to make here is we talked to some of the attributes of um, leadership here and inspiring leaders in particular probably being the risk taking the courage or whatever. But I think what I'd reflect on is that there is a danger that we're, we're trying to do is to create these people as super people or whatever. And I think that this idea, I think that Wendy might have started with, that there may be different forms of leadership right. does warrant. Um, exploring and we might need inspiring leaders I'm sure all of us in the audience and around the table say yes we do but there are other forms of leadership as well and there can be thought leaderships and some of our greatest scientists and we need them aren't likely to be the most inspiring people right okay uh, interesting controversial um, I'm gonna come to, uh, do you want to say yes I, I I'm interested in what you've just been saying and I do think that training is increasingly important. Uh, it's a long time since I was at university, but today talking to students, I'm hearing them criticizing their teachers because their teachers tend to be very clever guys who are doing very clever research stuff and are quite unable to communicate right. that information to okay. the students. They are not, in, they are leaders. Yeah sort of by definition, well, that's what they're paid for, yeah. by, in fact, they are not inspiring anybody. Okay. And the more and more the students tell me that they're avoiding the lectures and reading up the stuff online. Okay. So, there's another so we scene. need inspiring leadership, and I think it can be trained. Yeah. Train them as teachers. Okay. So, so along with curiosity and courage, um, we've also got communication. Um, Marianne. And I'm actually going to come back to the comment regarding um, risk. And I think um, something that, um, that makes me quite sad, actually, is the, how I hear of um, the reduction in um, exper experiments that kids do at schools. They're not allowed to get hands-on experience in their chemistry class and their physics class and their biology class. They're not, you know, some, I, um, you hear of kids not being able to go on school trips and have that freedom. And ultimately, if you don't get exposed to risk when you're younger... And the effect of that risk on you, if something goes wrong and it's only a little bit wrong, then actually what we see is a huge um, knock-on effect with, right. with not understanding risk. And actually, I think if we don't allow children these experiences, then we're going to have a problem once they do get into positions of, um, um, of, of leadership. So in a sense, what you're saying is instead of encouraging kids to take risks and encouraging this courage, uh, as Nick was saying, we're actually sort of moving away from that, we're moving into a kind of safer environment. Um, so I don't know, I mean, if, if you are familiar with the, the academic system, but I mean, one thing as academic we have to do always is try to get funding. And in the research councils, I mean, when we submit a grant, there's typically, yeah. especially in the PSRC, there's an item which is risk, but it's not just risk, it's risk and feasibility. So if you are very risky, but what you're proposing is not feasible, well, it counts nothing. If you don't take the risk, it also counts nothing. So I think that the good trade-off is to really go for something that is, I mean, groundbreaking, that is risky, but at the same time have a very clear plan of how you may want to achieve that. If you don't have this plan, I mean, it won't happen. So, and usually the research councils, they do something for academics that I think is very healthy. They, they, they are evaluating if you're really going for it, but at the same time they're evaluating if you really have a plan to, I mean, to achieve that. I mean, because taking a risk without a clear plan, I mean, it's yeah. it maybe so, not worth it. So it's not just about taking risk just for the sake of it. It's about the right risk 
and understanding that risk as well. Yeah. Can you understand the risk properly? Well, yeah. If, if, if you don't know, if you're doing research, is it possible to understand the risk you're taking? Well, sometimes even when you write a grant, I mean, you have to put very clearly what are the reasons for the grant potentially failing and what you're going to do about it. So you, you really have to think it through because it's not just you that I take a risk, maybe that something doesn't work. I mean, I have people working on this project. So the worst I can do is to maybe delay the career of a very bright guy that comes to my lab, wants to do a project, and suddenly it doesn't work. So I want to cover every possible aspect to try to make yeah. sure as much as I can that he will get something good out of it. So at least you're thinking about it. There was a point in the audience over there. Have you got the mic yet? Yes, I have. Um, I thought I'd try to broaden out this uh, debate because yeah. uh, we're here at the Science Festival. Actually, having inspired leaders in science and engineering isn't a problem in this country. You just walk around some of the uh, yeah. uh, events here we do that. However, what we do lack is inspiring leaders at a societal level. Right. And I think what's interesting, I'm part of a doctoral training partnership with NERC. We've got the EPSRC. Yep. And the big problem is that scientists and engineers who are trained very logically to weigh up risks, weight of evidence, don't end up being politicians. Yep. And the problem that we have here is we have yep. a political class that is dominated and I've got Russell sitting next to me who's out of Oxford, so I'd better be careful, um, dominated by PPE. Right. Philosophy, politics, and economics dominates our political class. Right. Whereas, if you imagine, if we had some of these wonderful engineers and scientists, like the Chinese uh, government, running the country and saying, let's weigh up the evidence, yeah. what is the best? Wouldn't that be a fantastic way of inspiring the country? Okay, so you think scientists, scientists are better leaders than let's say, philosophers or economists. Um, you sort of twitched when you said that. <laughs> um, I was twitching at something else. I would, well, I, would, I would question whether we definitely want to be more like China. There might be a, a bit of a middle ground between where we are and where the Chinese are. Uh, but I think it's a really interesting point. And if we think about one of the things that leaders do, you know, if we're all trying to innovate, we're all trying to come up with new things, one of the things that leaders do is really set the boundaries for innovation. They say, well, here's a defined problem, here's a defined challenge. I'm going to lead a bunch of people to, to solve that problem. And I think you're right in saying that one of the things that we're quite good at is having leadership in a very scientific context to say, right, we're going to solve this scientific challenge. What perhaps science in this country is perhaps not so good at doing is turning that into broader social action. So we know, for instance, very clearly, we set the goal through science that climate change is a big issue. I think science then hasn't stepped out of its comfort zone to say we need more of a social impetus and social leadership to, to tackle that challenge in concert with other parts of society. So scientists could actually be stepping out of the comfort zone and doing more for leadership on climate change. Is that what you're saying? Either scientists or perhaps science and scientists admitting that we need help from other people. We need to have other people coming in right. on this problem and, and having other people provide that leadership. Interesting. Okay. Um, sorry, Wendy. I'll come to you in a second. But, uh, over to okay, so picking up on a few of those things, um, I want to, I'm someone who's launched, has driven forward a new, whole new research discipline, and it's very interdisciplinary, and it's really hard to, to do that uh, because increasingly hard because you have to play safe. You talked about research proposals. We also have the awful, the REF in this country that That's means the, the Research Excellence Framework right. where we get audited every uh, how, seven, six, seven years and everyone has to produce their publications in very high quality journals which by definition have been in existence for a long time. It's really hard to say I'm going to publish, in, I'm going to work in a field where there are no journals. Right, because it's so way out, yeah. there's no, we've got to create the journals. And it's really hard for young, I'm okay, because I've made it, but it's really, really hard for the youngsters in the lab to say, no, I'm, we're going to do this work, there's no journal for you to publish in. And increasingly, we are, having, we are driven by metrics, yeah. we are driven by spreadsheets, we are driven by uh, so many different regu uh, um, regulatory authorities within and without the university. It's really hard and that you so need leadership to see you through that because young people starting out in their careers are going to be find that really difficult um, and, and, and interdisciplinary is something that um, uh, is really hard to do and I'm going to do a plug for the Longitude Prize here. I don't know if you all saw Horizon two weeks ago. Vote for the challenge that you want to win for the Longitude Prize, I'd suggest you vote for the one I spoke for, but I'm not going to. Um, uh, vote for it. Just vote and get involved in that challenge, because I think this could actually be a very inspiring thing for future research leaders. Okay, 
in a way that our system is not really that dynamic to actually move forward to combine new disciplines. Um, who is it that's responsible for making it more dynamic? Uh, maybe that's a question. Um, I'm going to come to you in a second, but there was there's a man in the audience. Let's not. Yeah, I, I just wanted to go back to this sort of assertion that uh, that it's a PPE dominated landscape, and for, for me. Uh, and, and I am a sort of a liberal artist by training, um, I don't see the scientists getting out there and you know, advocating for what they're doing and inspiring. And I went to hear Steve Jones last night, who's yeah. the antithesis of that. He's a brilliant communicator, and he excites people and inspires people. And for all the incredible things that happen in the scientific world that we all take for granted, like the light turning on when we come into a room, it's, no one's out there communicating what they're doing, not nearly to the extent necessary, and to inspire more people. You go into industry now, you can't get engineers because right. nobody's inspiring the young people. Okay, so it's actually up to, you're saying it's kind of up to those scientists to actually show a bit more leadership and actually take the initiative to communicate themselves and to, it's up to them to, to make it not dominated by uh, philosophers and economists. Um, I'm gonna, Andrew... Rodrigo, Nick, although you've not said much, so maybe you're, anyway, go on. Uh, well, I, I was going to just respond to that because I think in some areas we're getting better. Uh, I think the research councils have done a fantastic job with what grandly called the concordat for public engagement in science and research. And the principle is great because the principle is every research grant that is funded, you have to say when you propose it, when you're going for your money, how you will engage the public in that research, which, which is fantastic. Um, and as I say, working with the nuclear... I mean, shouldn't these scientists be doing it off their own back, taking the initiative, well, not because it's part of a grant, but actually because they want to communicate? I think some people will do it anyway, uh, and some people will want to stay locked away in, in their laboratory and not come out and talk to anybody about anything at all. So I think it's an encouragement. It's an encouragement in the right direction, an encouragement to provide training, and to go out and do it. But where we don't do it is with the people who work in industry right. because of this risk that we, uh, we talked about at the start. It's too risky. What if I said the wrong thing? What would be the impact on business? What would be the impact on the company? And one of the things I'm trying to do in my sector is to yeah. develop the principles that would say, actually, the workforce in science and engineering actually have trained, and those who are good at it and want to, should be encouraged and facilitated to go out and engage with the public in their work. Okay, so that, this is coming. Um, I, Liz, I'll come to you. Uh, I've got a whole queue of people, so I'll, I'll just shut up and let you all Do you want to go first? No, no, great. So basically, I, I brought this issue of, of getting funding, and, and uh, I want to clarify something about this. I mean, if, if I want to do something and I don't get funding, I just don't care. I just keep going with what I want to do. So well, there, are, there are many, well, pandemic. bad luck. I mean, sometimes you get a grant, sometimes you don't get it. And if you don't, as long as my vice chancellor can still take me, I mean, I will continue doing what I want to do. I mean, for me, the important thing is that I'm waking up every morning and doing exactly what I want to do, not what I'm told to do or not what I'm supposed to be doing. And, and there are many metrics and so on, as, 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 as Wendy said, that, that we get judged about. But I don't know, my, my, my way of dealing with it is like, well, I just don't care. I mean, and I keep doing what I want to do. And if I'm passionate about what I do, I really want to go for it. Well, I end up doing well because I, I, I really want to do that. And we have also highlighted areas. I mean, there are areas where if you do something specifically that's highlighted the, by the government and the research councils, you get better chance of doing well. But if it's not my area, well, I will convince you that it's a good area. Maybe it will be highlighted in the future. But I won't be driving my research based on, on this uh, test that, that we get, I mean, so subject your to. your research is driven by your passion, in a way. Yeah. Your passion and your, your direction that you want to research. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Um, somebody told me that Peter Higgs only pu has only published nine research papers in his entire career. Now, whether or not that, that's uh, yeah. correct or not, it reminds me of the... The impression that I, I've uh, formed that scientists aren't pursuing science, they're pursuing research papers to forward their careers because that's the only way they can pay the, the bills and keep their children in food and clothes and fish fingers and so forth. And, and I think science uh, needs, to, needs to really uh, 
from the, uh, rethink that whole approach to rewarding scientists, not for research <coughs> papers, but for what we're hopefully all excited about, which is inspirational and innovative work. Because, because the research paper uh, method of evaluating so-called scientists is completely broken. How would you do it? I'm sorry, I have no idea. Okay, so that's <laughs> Okay. Um, all right, so... Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to, to build on, really, the point that Wendy made about interdisciplinarity. Um, I think it's really encouraging, actually. We are working more and more with wider groups of people. I think there is a realisation now that a lot of the big challenges, those on the, um, for the Millennium Prize... Are, will only be solved by interdisciplinary groups and that it cannot just be solved by scientists or engineers alone. And that's really important. I think the other thing we've noticed is an increasing amount of universities engaging with industry. And also we've, we're working with a group of clinicians, academic engineers, um, industry and patients, all inputting into problems and challenges. And it's very, very exciting. And we've seen a very big change in those people coming all together with different dimensions on a problem. Is the communication there? Um, I think the communication is. I think it's all about language. And I think one of the interesting things about perhaps this debate now is that we're all talking in a non-scientific language. Yeah. I think what's interesting, and sometimes as a facilitator, what we do a lot of is translation because we're not involved in content. Um, we'll often say to scientists um, and engineers that we work with and people in social science, think about how would you communicate this to your granny? Right. And actually, that is a quite a good rule of thumb. It's not patronising, because yeah. I think it gets people to really think about the impact of their research, oh, and that's hugely there any, important. Are there any grandmothers in the audience? <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so... Okay, all right. Um, okay, over to... Uh, Thank there. you. Um, I wanted to go back for a moment to the um, issue of leadership in the kind of some of the big issues and going beyond the science to the, uh, the kind of wider public domain, so climate change and so on. And I think there's a quality that um, leaders who are really effective there have, which is about, um, the best word I can think of at the moment is kind of an openness or a curiosity. It means that they are able to step outside of their individual disciplines and work with others in a way that uh, Wendy was a, a big leader in. Uh, but it's still quite difficult. You still occasionally get you know physical scientists being quite rude about social scientists and you know there are good ones and bad ones of all, of, of all types versa. and vice versa um, and and so it requires it requires leadership to bring those together the other is to um, find that point if you're really going out into the, the, the sort of the public world and particularly the political world with issues like climate change to being passionately dispassionate um, because science is one of the lenses through which the public make decisions but it's only one so I think the real scientific leaders who are effective they maintain that conviction of the science but allow that values matter too and if you're taking part in the political arena then you need to uh, work with that too. Okay so maybe um, be able to communicate how the, how the science fits with the values. Um, I'm I just want to say, you know, there's a lot of different themes and subjects going around the table at the moment. Do we want to talk about the structure of science? Are we, is science structured in the way that encourages innovation? Do we want to talk about uh, the impact of scientists outside of science? Do we want to talk about communication in science? Um, there's a few hands in the audience. I will come to you very shortly. But, yeah. I just really wanted to echo the last point, this idea that in science really train not to think about feelings, not to think about values, but to really focus in on the facts and, and, and the statistics, when actually we know that leadership is really all about empathy and communication and all those sorts of softer skills. Um, and I think that that is a real challenge. Uh, and another thing that's just probably worth picking up on is this idea that, yes, things are becoming more interdisciplinary, so it's not just about biology, chemistry and physics, there's whole lots of things in between now, but it's also becoming much more about really big teams, you know, we've had this idea of kind of the great man of science yeah. so yes, like Peter Higgs, but also like Albert Einstein and all those sorts yeah. of people, and that model of science really, if it ever existed, is really in decline, if you look at the work that's gone on with the God particle at the Large Hadron Collider in, in CERN, how many, how many scientists was it? 5,000? 6,000? Yeah. And that's happening more and more, so the, the new centre we're building here in the UK, the Crick Centre, it's going to be the, the Europe's largest biomedical research facility. There's going to be thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of scientists working on projects together. So leadership is becoming ever more important, actually, and we need to think outside of the world of, right. that we're used to in terms of scientific context and, and values. 
is for a big project like that, like mm. the Large Hadron Collider or this giant research centre, do you need a scientist to be the leader of that team or could yeah. somebody who is a, an expert at leadership mm. be, the, be the leader? Well, I think it comes back to that question that good, good leaders need, need good followers as well. And if you're following someone, you need to be able to have trust in that person. Right. You need to trust their knowledge, trust their yeah. values, and trust, don't trust, trust their scientists. deference. Well, I think, <laughs> I think if they're leading you in a scientific yeah. context, it's probably reasonable to think, well, actually, they need to be a decent scientist as well. You know, they need to have been through what I've gone through in order for me to follow them. So I think that, is, that probably is fair. OK, we've got a question in the audience. Yeah. Can you hear me? It's just going back to the beginning when the members of the panel introduced themselves and what they do, um, and some said they present their findings and recommendations to politicians. Going further on, the question was risk. I find, to my mind, politicians are so mediocre at the moment that they're so worried about their own bloody positions, they yeah. are not going to listen to sense and sensibility. The only person, and I'll saw my mouth by using his name is Nigel Farage, who seems to have inspired a large percentage of this population for the wrong reasons. What are the penalty? Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> He's a leader. Yeah. He's for sure an inspirational leader, whatever you think of him, but there have been lots of good and bad examples of inspirational leaders throughout yeah. history, but he's a leader. Okay. Is it about taking risks, do you think? Well, I mean, for sure he's taken a risk. And I do think, we've talked about this before on the panel, it is about taking risks, and it is about people who are courageous enough to taste risks, and uh, other people, if they think they're wrong, need to stand up. Um, uh, but I, I, so the, sorry, I've lost my thread there, but I was thinking, about, uh, it, it is absolutely about risk taking, and in science, um, there's a lot of money involved when you take a risk, so. Well, Imran's probably the expert on this, but I think that m what many of us will see in terms of that political uh, dimension, and this is some of the reason why I think that scientists, my broader point here will be that this is some of the reasons why scientists are often aren't so good at making the advocacy that some of our audience members uh, are talking about. But let, let's be clear, when the politicians are making decisions, science evidence is one input to them. It's not the only input to them. And that's probably a factor of democracy. And I don't think even being an administrator of science, a manager of science, that I would want to see them doing anything other than that. Of course, what I would really like the politicians to do is to explain why when the science is pointing one way, they don't do something. But I don't think we should ever get to the point where we say, because the science points one way, it must be this way. I think that's a different issue. Example where the, you don't feel the science has been done. Well, I mean, no, no. I mean, the, the obvious example, the one that got into all the papers, was, was when Professor Nutt was talking about his, uh, the, the drug policy in the UK. And the science was all pointing in a, in a direction, although, let us be clear, some scientists would probably dispute where that was going. But let's say the bulk of opinion and certainly that committee was pointing in one direction but the politicians for other reasons non-scientific reasons took a different decision now I, I think where I would stand is that they should have the ability to do that but they should be able to explain why when they do do that um, but I think as I say the meta point here and I'll be very quick on this is that this whole element of risk I mean scientists or many scientists aren't comfortable with the idea of soundbite and certainty in the way that Nigel Farage might be comfortable with that. And that is some of the communication difficulty that we have. But I think that we just have to remember our audience. When you are talking to journalists, scientists have to be able to simplify and accept that when they are talking there, that they will be making simplifications and just accept that. Because otherwise, you will always struggle to communicate with that audience. Okay, so in a way, a little bit of soundbite science I mean, I think you have to. Um, okay. I'd just like to link a couple of comments from the audience, if that's okay. And it's probably going to end up as a question, I think, um, as, a, as, an, as a potential future leader. Uh, so the comment here about the UKIP um, uh, leadership and the comment here about risk and, and um, Labour and Tony Blair, um, 
links to me to the comment about um, PPE students becoming the future leaders. They're groomed from probably before they go to university to be politicians and leaders. And I'm just wondering if it's something that we need to be thinking about with our science students. Um, do we need to start grooming them, training them, preparing them for future um, roles in politics? Okay, so you think, back, in a way, back to this question about schools and education and teaching courage and curiosity and communication. Um, so do you want to go in that direction? Um, and, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the reason Atty said I might have something to say about the, um, the politics issues, because in a previous job I ran something called the Campaign for Science and Engineering, and there we really were trying to make the, the point to politicians that they need to do really controversial things like you know, invest in science and mass education, use evidence-based policy, increase funding for research. Um, what we found was that you had some MPs and ministers who were really pro-science, you know, actually the likes of David Willits who can make it here today, and some MPs who are probably not quite so first, and I, and I, and I won't name them. But, what, but the issue was that the, if, you, if you're looking at something like science funding, the difference between those two camps is really that the pro-science people are looking at a kind of a 10 to 15% increase in science funding, and the people who don't care so much are looking at maybe a 5% decrease. And actually, people like me who are really passionate about science, I think we need a doubling, a tripling, a quadrupling of science funding. And you can't even have that conversation. And the reason you can't have that conversation is because those MPs know that they're not going to get emails from their constituents saying, why, did you invest, why didn't you invest my money in science? Why did you invest my money in science? And it links into the point we've just yeah. had in that, yes, we could train more scientists to be leaders, and that might be one way of changing the political landscape. But I think the, the, the longer-term issue we have to face up to is having scientific leadership to actually change the values base of our country. You know, you all here in the audience, if you think science is important, you think politicians should take science more seriously, email your MP. You know, next time there's an election, ask them a question at a hustings. That's the way we're going to get changed when they start to think that we see science as part of our values base. Okay. And I think there's a scientific leadership role there we have to all have to play. So actually it's the general population of the country, the electorate, that needs to be more excited about science. We've got a question at the back there, or a comment at the back. Yeah, I want to make the case I'm not sure it's quite as bad as everyone thinks, because I, I think a lot of us, I, I'm an academic, and I'm sure I'm one of the RISE leaders as well. And I think that um, in our department anyway, which is a very cross-disciplinary biomedical engineering area, and uh, we actually have all our PhD students and postdocs are all STEM ambassadors. You may know about the STEM ambassador pro uh, procedure, I mean, system, it's an excellent way in which we get academics to go out into schools, interact with children all the time. And our students all go out into schools, but you can only go to one school at a time, and they do yeah. have to do their PhDs and their postdocs as well. So the, the number of people you can see is maybe limited at any one time. But it's a huge issue, and they love doing it. They get an enormous benefit from going and talking to school children. Right. They learn a lot from it, and they really enjoy it, and the school children enjoy so it. So you, you actually think that that leadership is actually on its way through and we're going to see it uh, I think it's there. in a few decades' time. I think a lot of in, in academia time. are doing this, yeah. we, but we can't go to a school every week because we actually have to do our day job as well. Okay. Um, but I think we're all trying. Maybe we need to have a few more people doing it, but a lot of people are doing it. And I don't think we should knock the effort that people are putting into trying to do this and the fact that these young people really, really enjoy doing it as well. Okay, so it's not just because it's something they have to do that's on the form. They actually are into it. And yeah, maybe we'll, we'll see a difference in 10 years' time or, or 15 years' time. Um, OK. Um, I want to link that and what Imran said and something that was said earlier. Uh, yes, this is really important, getting our science and engineers to be ambassadors and get more people in, but the lead has to come from the funders. And I would back Imran. We, we why, should... Why well, it has to come from the government, right? The lead really has to, it, because you have to make it something that isn't a declining industry. Science and engineering research is a declining industry in the UK, right? There's less and less money going in every year. And the students see that. That's what they, they feel when they go to a university, is that there isn't the passion that says, we, we have to have more scientists and engineers. And, and we're going to have to turn that around as a country or we will lose out to China. And I'm going to go back to that because when you go to China, they may have a different political and cultural issue, but boy, are they churning out the scientists and engineers. And we've lost that battle. Okay. We have lost it. Um, are we uh, or we lost? Well, unless, some, unless somebody, and this is the trouble with the PPE politicians, they don't get it. 
They just don't get it. And it, to me, it's a really sad, inevitable decline, which is why I'm increasingly looking to Southeast Asia for where I'm going to do my research. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, hopefully this ties into what we're doing. I'd like to uh, ask the experts around the table and also among the audience um, what they think of the following idea, that uh, scientists get paid to investigate cures uh, because you can sell people a cure. You can sell the NHS a cure or whatever else. Um, and they're not paid, you're not rewarded uh, to investigate prevention. Let me use two examples, please. In cancer, just 3% of all the money uh, uh, that funds cancer research and so forth is uh, in, in just 3% is in, in the prevention thereof. And in my field of well-being and teaching young people how to take care of themselves, um, RPM thought it prudent to invest one million pound um, last year in investigating the well-being of the UK and so forth. And you weigh up, weigh up that one million divided into 65 million or whatever, so he thought it was worth about 50 pence per person or, or whatever. Um, uh, and compare that to the incredible cost of obesity, of depression, of alcoholism and all those things which can come about so easily if our young people and our not so young people don't know how to take care of themselves uh, through s psychological well-being skills and so forth. So my core question is, why do, uh, uh, do you not think that f because there's financial gain for the big industries to sell us cures rather than you can't sell prevention, but, uh, particularly if, if, for instance, the, the yeah. field of cancer prevention is exercise, fresh air, sunlight, s sleep well. These are the sorts of things that will prevent cancer. No one has a monopoly of those, so that's why it only gets 3%. Okay, interesting. Um, so there's a, few, there's a few comments from the audience. Let's get those. I will say that we are, um, we've got 13 minutes left, so uh, I'm just going to, but uh, let's, let's have some, let's have like three comments from the audience and then we'll come back to the panel. Over to you. Um, hello, I'm, I'm actually a business psychologist and I've worked with business leaders in 23 countries over 10 years. And it occurs to me that if, if you want to do a soundbite, like y'all have talked about, that, that, that you might boil down what a leader does into two things. They, they set a direction and then they get people to move in that direction. Right. And I'm, and I'm hearing a, a lot of uh, different uh, frames within which you think leaders should work within science. There's the microcosm. We need to lead people in, in research. And there's the macrocosm. We need, to, we need to have an impact on society. Right. And, and I would like to hear from you know, some of the, the folks up there what they really think that, that some good leadership within, within the scientific community could do along those lines. You know, let's hear some, here's what we'd like to see. Uh, from my perspective, the most important things facing us right now are the climate, the population explosion, uh, our, our use of natural resources, and I don't see the answers to those questions coming from the PPE politicians. I see them coming from you folks there. Okay, so you, like want, you want some vision, basically. I'd, I'd like to hear a little a bit. Yeah, okay. Um, let's move, let's hear some, some of the other points over here. Come, Abby, you need to get yourself over there. Um. Hello. Um, Hello. For just a quick one, for the lady at the top there who was saying about getting people out to schools, why not get the teachers into them so the teachers can be the leaders and the ambassadors right. to the children and they'll do it on a year by year basis right through. Rather, It doesn't work when someone goes out for a couple of days, uh, the children remember for a couple of days. Get the teachers trained, right. get them interested in science and uh, yeah. engineering that side. I think that's a, a good approach. Now, my point is, um, I... Oh, I thought that was your point. No, no, no I've got another point. Yeah. Lady there, yeah. sorry. Uh, um, in my dim and distant past, when I was enthusiastic, I did postgrad research and I did product development, and I got totally frustrated uh, by all the bureaucracy. Now, the, the crowd here that we have here today, we seem to have lots of uh, three, four, possibly a five-letter abbreviation, lots of committees, all with 
they have to have their own agendas because they're organisations in their own right. So my question is, if someone like Ken Robinson, I'm, I'm sure people have heard of Ken Robinson on creativity, or if he was alive, Steve Jobs was here, talking to you, what would he say to you? That's what I want okay, to Okay, I'm going to turn that around. What do you think Ken Robinson would say? I think he would say that there is too much um, teaching of basics, which is what the government wants to do now, going to maths and English, not enough in creativity, it's not generating okay. all-round people, uh, rounded people. They're, people are there for statistics, and it's there for the government to say, so, oh, we've increased this, we've increased this, we're doing well in Regicate. It's all to get re-elected. Okay, so it's all about the numbers and not enough about creativity. Is that, yeah. is that a scientific approach? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, that's just a question. Well, there's another point from, okay, well, we'll just get this one as well. Right, it's to follow on from what that chap said. I think there's too much testing of children at school and everybody's trained to sort of um, pass the exams rather than being develop themselves to yeah. think for themselves, to do things for themselves. Okay. And, uh, and of course uh, there's this sort of health and safety coming in which restricts them even further. So um, I think if they were allowed to be more creative and let the natural things flow, you'd find people um, would be able to think more. Okay, think so, so we've got another C on top of the curious, courageous and communicative. We've also got creative. <laughs> are, are our young people creative enough? Um, and in a way, ironically, is teaching science, should that be less about numbers and metrics and more about thinking for yourself and more about creativity? Um, and then there's the question of the vision over there. We mustn't forget that. What is your vision for the future? It's up to you to decide where you want to take this. This is Tokioki, so uh, um, I'm going to... Okay. Um, I wanted to pick up on the vision um, thing for a moment. There's a, just to give an example, um, one of the ways of bringing leading scientists and the people who are going to make decisions together is to have something that is kind of um, concrete, tangible. We're working on cities. Cities are really interesting because most of us live in urban areas um, and constantly making decisions now that will have an impact for decades in terms of planning and so on. And it's, uh, there's some, this, this particular project is being led by uh, Alan Wilson, who's at UCL. And it's anthropologists, it's uh, the high-tech people, the smart cities, but it's the people who understand how um, you know, groups live in cities, how communities develop, and we're doing work with cities, with city mayors. So it's, it can be done, but it's very intensive. It's very, you know, it takes time, you've got to build trust, you've got to build relationships between the disciplines and between the scientists and the, and the citizens. But actually there's some really good examples, and there are many others. Okay, so you're... I'm saying it can be done. Okay, it can be done, there's, a bit, there's belief there. Um... Yeah, I, I just want to kind of pick up on both those points. Um, I think... One of the things we need to encourage is a lot more trust um, in amongst, between science and society. Um, I think we've also got to encourage um, a lot more open debate. Yeah. What do you think would actually um, the trust? Uh, I suppose it's a greater understanding. Um, I think the British media doesn't always support science in the way it could support science. Um, do you agree with Marianne about this kind of about the soundbite science. Yeah, I do, actually. I mean, I think there's, there's been this campaign, the pint of science. I think that happened in Bath. And, and I think, you know, there's a lot, a lot of public engagement going on, way more than I think people realise. Um, I think there's a lot of time being spent within universities. We're working a lot with very early career researchers about how they, can, how they should communicate the impact of their research. The EPSRC are doing a lot through their, their uh, CDTs. Um, I think it's also about um, creating this, this, this really healthy open debate amongst established scientists and early career scientists. Um, and I think that will help a lot of the vision. And, and I think we should never have a vision. I think a vision should change. Right. It needs to adapt. And I think we've all got to be prepared for that. Okay. Um, so I do think that clearly scientists need to communicate and do it effectively. But I would disagree with the idea that we should expect the media to kind of be more supportive inherently. I think if there are any journalists in the room, they'd say that their job is to critique and criticise and analyse, and science shouldn't get a free ride. 
And actually, I think that's really important, because I think if the public saw that science wasn't being criticised, they'd see even more of something that's apart from society. And if you don't feel connected to science, then why would you trust it? Why would you think the scientists are worth listening to and, and trusting? And I think if someone asked what a good example of this leadership might look like, there's a really recent and current one, which is this, it's a really bad name for it, but three parent babies, where you know, a number of years ago, we started to find out that actually you could cure these really terrible syndromes where uh, babies are born with mitochondria that aren't functioning properly. Um, research has led us to think that we can actually cure this by having uh, babies with genetic material from three different parents and we're now at a point where that legislation is you know, being put to part when we're, in, we're on the verge of seeing these diseases being really tackled in a meaningful way and that's something that despite the kind of the yuck factor, the Frankenstein factor all those kind of ethical considerations scientists have shown leadership in saying here's a, here's a terrible disease, we figured out a way to solve it let's all work together and talk about the issues that it raises and we'll provide the leadership. We're not just going to hand it over to politicians and say, well, you deal with it now. Science has been at the forefront of that, and I think that's really powerful. And going to Liz's point about trust, do you think that's actually building trust in scientists? Do you think the trust is there? I think it is. I think, it, I think when you have scientists talking about the research and what it can do um, and why they want to do it, actually, I think motivations are really important. And again, that's something that sometimes scientists, I think, feel that they shouldn't talk about. They shouldn't talk about their motivations because that makes them seem maybe biased into finding a certain answer. But actually, I think it also makes them more human. And you've got to appear human. You've got to be human in order to be trusted by the public. OK. Um, well, I think everyone's been very successful in appearing human. <laughs> here today. Um, I think my final thought would be, all of those things are important, but let's not try and think that they all have to be in the same person, right? Okay. So, I mean, could a leader then be like a group of people, in a way? Well, like... well you made the point earlier on. I think there is an element of that there has to be thought leadership, and that's hugely important in science and engineering, absolutely there. But those thought leaders may not be the people who are bringing together the consortium of collaborators who will effectively get the great things done. So I think there's that type of leadership as well. Now, some people might call that management, but the gentleman over there was talking about getting people behind something, and that's what that type of leadership does, and that okay. might not be thought leadership. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to let you come back quickly. No, no, actually, I just want to agree with Wendy, and I should have said, I think it's about having that scientific career first and then recognising that we can get involved at a more senior time. Okay. Um, final thought? Very different thought to, to kind of leave you on. Um, okay. This idea that why we think we need leaders, I think we've always wanted leaders. We want to know, you know, why, why, why do the crops grow and why do, the, why do the rains come, why do they not come, why do we get ill? I think we want people to blame and people to credit. And I think that's, that's a double-edged sword, you know. I think if scientists want to be there to people that take the credit, we also want people to blame. So there's, a, there's, there's pros and cons to being leaders. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to come back to the two Cs that, uh, that I said earlier. I think we should encourage science, scientists and engineers to be curious and continue to be curious right through their careers. And I think we should encourage them to be courageous. Okay. What about creative and what well, about creative. Well, I think all that will come as a cons and communicative and collaborative. Okay. <laughs> oh, collaborative. We've got five C's now. Yeah, I'm going to give you a six. Um, one of the things that's really come out to me, and I'm just going to summarise it in, in another proverb. We started with a proverb. But I've got one which is the way of the fool seems right to them, but the wise listens to advice. And I think as leaders, we need uh, we need advice, which needs consultation. Okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when I'm when I uh, think of an inspirational leader, I think of JFK uh, because, and I think it's a good rule of thumb, if the people around you are trying to kill you, it's probably because you are being so innovative. And uh, 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 so if, if uh, I would say to, a, to all young people coming into science and engineering and so forth that uh, uh, do things that really upset the people around you. Otherwise, you're, you're not an innovator, you're, you're an ad administrator. Okay, so you're only, you're only doing well when people are trying to kill you. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> well, I hope that wasn't going to try and kill me. Anyway, yeah. I'm not doing well. Yeah. So, but for, I mean, there were many things discussed here, but I, to me, I want to summarize them in one word, is passion. I mean, for me, what, what is to be inspirational and what I see in a leader is, is passion. And a good leader is somebody that, where you see that the passion is contagious. So basically, I think I'm a good leader if I have my passion. I really want to do what I do every single day. I'm dying to do that. And I think I'm a good leader if I transmit this to the guys working with me, that they also feel, wow, we really want to be part of this because this is really something amazing. And I think basically it all gets down to that. And if you talk about interactions with the media and these things, well, if you're passionate about what you do, 
I mean, typically, Nia likes that. And, and I don't know, I think many things come together. Okay. So, I mean, can I just ask you very, very quickly? That's a round of applause for that. Well, thank you. Yeah, come on, yeah, come on. Everybody, come on. Round of applause. Can you make passion or is it something you're born with? Is it something you can... I think the passion comes... I mean, my wife told me one day that she said, I, you are very lucky because every morning you go to work doing exactly what you want to do. And I think this comes back to something we could learn at school or we can be encouraged to do at school. I think the key is to just go for what you want to do. Okay. And I think if kids will do that, if we all do in our professions what we really want to do, well, the passion is there. Yeah. Okay. Um, two things, we, we shouldn't talk the UK down, um, its science base is still fantastic, um, it's the only government that has a chief scientific advisor in every department and has had, a, have, had one for 50 years, um, so we're doing, we, we can do more but we're doing, we're doing better than most other countries. Um, the other thing is um, we all have a role to play, the passion point is absolutely true, but vote for the Longitude Prize, become a STEM yeah. ambassador, sign up to the Your Life campaign, get more diversity in science, keep talking to your MPs, keep complaining about them if you want to, but just keep can, active. Can the government make us more passionate. How do they make that? We don't know. Okay, we'll leave that one hanging. Yeah. Thanks very much to everyone. Thanks to the EP. Thanks very much for coming, and if you, I mean, I guess we'll all be sitting around if you've got any questions uh, that you want to ask us now. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks to Mike on sound and Tom on the management of this. Thank you.